that God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became as a fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. This is the word of the Lord. We live in a country full of people with doubts. We live in a place that is full of skeptical people. Not that different than the people of Rome who were receiving this letter from the Apostle Paul. He's writing to this capital of the Roman Empire. As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, there were all sorts of varieties of belief. Some who believed in many gods, Zeus and Apollo and Aphrodite. Some who believed in one God. Some who followed the teachings of different philosophers, Plato and Epicurus and the Stoics. And Paul is writing this letter to the church, the people who believe in one God, the Father, and in His Son, Jesus Christ, and who have experienced the work of His Holy Spirit. But he's writing to make a case for this belief, that people would be convinced that this makes sense, that this is true. And in Belgium today, it's not that different. There are a variety of things that people can believe. There are a lot of people who doubt Christianity, who doubt even the existence of God. I found some statistics. I can't say exactly how accurate these may be. These are just from Wikipedia or some site, but roughly 28% of people in Belgium believe there is no God at all. 31% believe there is a spirit or a life force, but not a personal God. 37% believe there is a God, but only 5% of the population attends worship services at a church. So you might be, when you go to work, you might be the only person who believes in God. When you go to school, you might be the only student who attends a church. A friend of mine from uh, university went on to get a master's degree and then a doctorate in philosophy. And he said of all the students in his program, he was the only one who believed in any God of any kind. And the others were all atheists. And they had various reasons, motivations for believing what they did. And my friend Steve had reasons to believe what he did, that there is a God. And that's what I would like to address this morning, is some of the reasons to believe what we believe, because you find yourselves sometimes uh, put on the spot. Why would you believe that? Haven't you grown out of that like the rest of us? And it's important to have some reasons to give why we believe the things that we believe. When Paul writes this to the church in Rome, we read that uh, he says, some things about God are obvious, they are known because of the world that we live in. Just observing the world around us tells us some things about God, some basic things. 
out today. We have the tool of science, which is a way of observing and learning about the world around us. So using the tool of science, does it tell us something about whether or not there is a God? And does science tell us something ab about who God is, what God is like? And I'm not expecting, I'm not trying to prove that there is a God, but simply to ask questions. And taken all together, the things we observe and the questions we ask, do they lead us to the conclusion that God is there? And these are questions for everybody to consider. There are a lot of people who say there is no God, and if you ask them the reasons why they've come to that belief, they really can't give very much. And if you can say, well, these are some of the questions I have, some of the reasons that I believe, they may be moved in some small way at least. So the first question, I have a picture for you. First, uh, oh, let's go back to that, Isaac. This just reminds me of old times. I, my son Isaac, used to always run the computer in our old church too. And I think I forgot things and he'd remind me sometimes back then also. This is what it says in Romans 20. We read this already. Since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see His invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature. This is the claim that we read from Romans chapter 1. First picture, then, of the question, what does the world tell us about God? Here's a man standing, looking at the stars in this great galaxy, this incredible universe that exists. First question, why is there something? rather than nothing. Why does the world exist? My dentist back in California was an atheist. He believes there is no God. And I only would see him, I think, once a year or every six months or something, you know. Usually, sometimes I'd go in and just get my teeth cleaned. Sometimes the dentist would come check. So I had about five minutes a year to have a conversation with my dentist. So he came in, and I knew he was an atheist, and so he, before he takes a look at my teeth, I say, Hey, Mike, tell me, why is there something rather than nothing? This is how I start conversations. And he said, my first thought is, it's all just chance. But then that doesn't seem very likely, does it? And there we were off, we had five minutes, maybe we stretched to ten minutes to talk about reasons to believe or not to believe. How did this all come to exist? Of course, people will say there was a big bang. Everything exploded out of nothing. And say, okay, that's, yeah, all right, let's say there was a big bang. Why was there a big bang? I read a book written by an atheist called Why Does the World Exist? And he really does not like the idea of a God, so he wrote this book to explain why does the world exist? Why did the Big Bang happen, even though, in his opinion, there is no God? And uh, he says that maybe the laws of physics, the laws of the universe, and nothingness itself is unstable. And so some quantum fluctuation caused everything to suddenly come into existence out of nothing. Well, consider, why is there something rather than nothing? And is that a more likely explanation for the existence of all there is than the Christian explanation? That the universe exists because God wanted it to exist and caused it to come into being. The second question that I have for people who say there is no God is, and another, another uh, picture here, this is supposed to show gravity, that the Earth is pulling this satellite or whatever it is into its gravitational field and everything in the universe has gravity. And the question is, why does gravity have, is, why is it just as strong as it is? Because if it was just a tiny bit stronger, everything would collapse. 
the satellites would collapse into Earth and Earth would collapse into the Sun and we wouldn't have any planets and we wouldn't exist. But if gravity was just a slightly, a, a tiny bit weaker, then everything would fly apart and no planets would form in that case either. There are some people who have gone through and looked at these, what we just consider laws of physics, laws of nature, the, the way things work, that in an atom there is a proton and an electron. And this is how atoms form molecules. They are connected and they attract. And the size of the proton compared to an electron is like 2,000 times larger. And that's what enables them to form things. And the electron is so much smaller, but it has the equal electric charge so that they can connect, like magnets do. Maybe this is confusing because I'm not a very good chemist. The point is that if the size of these things inside an atom was any different, molecules could not form. If the electric charge between these two parts of an atom was different, molecules could not form and we would not have things as simple as water or air. And you can go on and list many more things. The speed at which things are moving in the universe, the fact that ice floats most things when they get cold and they become solid become less dense and they sink and if that happened in our world then water would freeze and it would sink to the bottom of the ocean and it would never come never turn into water again but ice floats all these number of things make you ask the question why is the world the way it is so that human beings can live so that there can be life how do you explain that? Well, my wife's grandfather is an atheist, and we've had some great conversations about all these things. He has an explanation. He says, well, any world is not likely, and this just happens to be the one we are in. And no, it's not likely that things turned out this way, but this is how it is. Okay, back to the same question. Is that more convincing? than the belief that there is a God who not only created the world but designed it in just a way that the force of gravity and the size of protons and electrons and water and all these things that I mentioned and many many more that God designed it on purpose so that our human life is possible. Third question and I have another slide for you is how did life begin? Let's say the atheists are right. Let's say that there was a Big Bang that came out of nothing for no reason. It just, it just you know, happened. It's all random chance. How did life ever begin? This is a single cell. If you took biology class, you might recognize this is a paramecium. All right, one cell, and this is a living thing. How did stuff come together and live? Take in food, produce energy. How did it happen? And, next slide, if something did come together and was suddenly alive by random chance, how did it have the goal of reproducing and making many paramecia? Right? If it happened once by chance that something came alive, why did it reproduce itself? Doesn't that seem like an odd thing that it would happen? How did this happen? What are the explanations? And the next question is, how did life go from one cell, one living cell, to multiple cells together? because it's far more complicated. This, by the way, is a slice from a blade of grass. And every little dot is a cell, so the paramecium. Imagine many of those things put together in a plant. It also looks like there are smiling faces in there, which is a little strange, isn't it? The color has been added, by the way. Now, Peter and I, listened to this, this um, Radio Lab podcast, which is usually very fascinating. Often it's about scientific issues. And they were uh, talking with a, uh, a scientist and asking the question about these mysteries of life. 
They said, the first mystery is, how did life begin? And they said, of course, nobody knows the answer to that. The third mystery, though, which was, we'll get to in a moment, but is, how do we have this awareness as human beings? He said, everybody knows about those two mysteries. They don't know about the second mystery, which is this. How did life go from one cell to many cells in one thing? How did it go from a paramecium to many things together? And they're coming at it from a scientific perspective, trying to explain. They said, it's really, to sum up, it's impossible. Because the jump is too big of what's required for the energy that goes into one cell compared to many cells. And when you have many cells together, they're doing different things. And how do they kind of decide among them that these cells become a liver, these cells become a heart, these cells transport blood? Of course, it's simpler on a smaller scale, but still, how do they divide up the work like that? They said it's impossible, but it happened. And we know it happened because here we are. So either an impossible thing happened or God made it happen. And not just at this one point, but the existence of the universe itself, the beginning of life, the laws in the universe, on and on. Either it becomes more and more impossible or you are led more and more to say, there is a God. I already mentioned, but back to this picture here of this person contemplating the stars in the universe. The other question, how did human beings become human beings? Where we can think, we are aware, we have this self we are conscious. We can look at the universe and ask these questions. We can ask, what is the meaning of life? What is my purpose here? How did we become these kinds of beings that ask these questions, that have these desires? Here you are sitting, listening to a sermon, at least I hope you're listening to the sermon. Think for a moment about what you're doing. Think about the fact that you are thinking, that you're breathing, that you're aware. Isn't that an amazing thing? That we have this life? Doesn't it feel like a gift? All these things together, then you decide which makes more sense. My dentist, he said, it's all random chance. But then that doesn't seem very likely, does it? Or then the alternative is the other side, what we said in this Nicene Creed, this statement of faith, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Is that so far-fetched? Is that so hard to believe that there is one God who has created all things and that we exist because He wanted us to exist? Somebody who is a very um, serious skeptic would say, yes, but I need proof. I want proof that there is a God. Well, I can't give proof. I don't think anybody can give proof of something like this. But what Paul says is that the things that are visible that we see point us to God who is invisible. They point us to the Creator. I would also say to somebody who says, I need proof, but this is not actually how we live our lives as human beings. We don't ask for proof for everything. If I ask a man, does your wife love you? And he says, yes. I say, prove it. How do you know? Well, because she, she's kind, she's patient, she forgives me. She said yes when I asked her to marry me. Yeah, but prove that she loves you. How do you really know? Maybe it's all a show. Maybe she's cheating on you. How do you know? 
I just know. Based on the evidence, based on the, my experience with her, I know, I believe that my wife loves me. And if you ask a person, how do you know that there is a God? Can you prove it to me? Well, no, I can't prove it, but all these things taken together, plus other things, I didn't mention every reason that I believe that there is a God, but all these things together convince me that yes, there is a God. Now, I mentioned um, science is one tool for observing the world. But that's not the only way we experience the world, is through science, to measure and to, ev and to examine things and evaluate things. That's not the only way we experience the world. There is an emotional part, something that involves our whole being. This man, uh, this next picture is a, a photographer for National Geographic, and he went in the... Um, Antarctic Ocean and took these pictures of a leopard seal, which is a huge, ferocious animal, really. It brought him a dead penguin. Right? And this man, I heard an interview with him, he was describing this encounter in the water with his leopard seal, and as he was telling about it, he started to cry because he said this encounter with this animal was so overwhelming in its emotion. Uh, he's just there to record a leopard seal, to record this wildlife, and he's deeply moved by it. Where does that come from? How is it that we go through life not just observing, but we are moved by things deep down? One of my new friends here in, in, in Antwerp is a photographer, and I found a, a, a few of his pictures on Facebook, and uh, I'm a person who loves the mountains, so when I saw this picture, I am moved. It makes me want to cry or sing or actually really makes me want to hike. It makes me want to go there. I don't know if you experience that with this or with other things, but when you see beauty, are you not moved inside? And another picture from the same, same guy. Oh my goodness. And I think, well, at least I now live in Europe and I can go there. These pictures are from the Alps. I love mountains. Right? When you see beauty or hear beauty in music, you move deep down. Where does that come from? What do you do with that sense of awe and wonder and gratitude? By the way, if you need a photographer for a wedding or school photos or something, I'll give you his name is Ronnie Gabriels. Obviously, he's a good photographer. Beauty moves us. Beauty is something we recognize. Where does that come from? The children's message, I showed that picture of the wave and said, what does the artist artwork tell you about the artist? If you look at the world around us, then what does the world tell you about the artist? This response when we see some things is, is simply, wow. And you feel that overwhelm and you feel that emotion to say, wow. And that is pretty close to what the Bible describes as worship. To recognize God's power and glory and say, wow. Uh, a friend from, of mine from Los Angeles, in his life, went from being an atheist to becoming a Christian. And he, he learned in this process that the world is not just something to, be observe, something to observe and to measure, but uh, it's uh, something to admire and something to be moved by. And so one of his things he said after he had become a Christian, he said, reality is so exciting. Reality is so exciting. Before he believed there is no God, and he came to believe there is a God who is personal and we can know. And in saying this, he's now recognizing all the world as some expression of God's goodness 
God's power, God's glory, and he said, reality is so exciting. Is this not important to the way we live and what we believe, that it is credible, it makes sense intellectually, but also it's moving, it's exciting, it's satisfying to us as people. One more question. All right, so I gave a number of things from science. One question that has to do more from the artist's perspective of beauty. One more question that has to do with um, justice, right and wrong. Which is simply, where does that sense of right and wrong come from? People who do not, who, who say there is no God, still will want to say, yeah, but there is good and bad. There is still some kind of right and wrong. And sometimes people say, well, no, it's all relative. If you grew up in some other part of the world, well, what you believe is just come conditioned by your culture, and it's not go good or bad, it's not right or wrong, it's just, it is what it is. But even those people, if they hear about some of the things that happen in the world today, are horrified and feel this outrage that people are made to be slaves, that people are murdered for no reason, that people are abused and raped, and they will say, that is not right. And my question is, how do you say that is not right? Obviously some people in the world claim that it is okay. Who says that it's not right? Where does that feeling so deep down come from? We can say as Christians, that when somebody takes advantage of another person that is going against, it is violating God's design for humanity. That people are equal and people deserve dignity and respect because God has created us. If somebody else, on what basis do your judgments of good and bad, right and wrong come from? There's a professor uh, somewhere in Australia now who was an atheist when she went to uh, Oxford, a Cambridge University, and then on to get a uh, master's and a PhD at Oxford. And while she was there, she heard this atheist philosopher, Peter Singer, come and speak. And uh, this atheist philosopher recognized and spoke about the fact that as an atheist, he had a bit of a challenge because he wanted to believe in the equality of all people. But he recognized not everybody in the world agrees that everybody is equal. Some people say, we're better and we will prove it by killing you. We will prove it by showing our power, showing that we are superior. And this woman, of course, thought that everybody was equal, but she realized without a God, she really had no basis for that belief. So that, together with some other things, led her finally to conclude there is a God. And this, the, the next part, that God has come to this world in Jesus Christ to make those very things right. So this sense of right and wrong, when we have this sense of right and wrong, the next part is that there is a sense in all of us of also falling short. If you come to say there is a God, then you also come to say, I'm in trouble. Because even our own moral standards, we don't complete. The next part of what it says in, in uh, Romans 1, he says that uh, people know things about God, but they suppress the truth, they hide the truth, they ignore what they know about God. And this makes sense because it's not convenient for a lot of people to acknowledge that there is a God. 
I heard a story of a, a college student who had um, an encounter of the power of God that was undeniable. And so somebody from a Christian ministry on the campus went to talk with a student after this happened, uh, went and knocked on his dorm room door and said, hey, what do you think? Are you going to come to this, uh, you know, our gathering of Christian students and learn more? And the guy said, well, I'm grateful to God or Jesus or whoever it was who did this for me, but I'll be honest, I like my life. I like partying. And I don't want to change anything. He knew beyond any doubt there is a God and that God had done something powerful in his life and yet he was choosing, I'm going to put that aside because it would be too inconvenient for me. Now we all then need to recognize there is a God. There are many reasons to believe things that direct us to that and to be honest then the way to approach God is not based on I'll just become a little better I'll try harder and this is where religions of the world are very different I remember a conversation with a friend of mine who's from a different religion this is back in the United States when you realize you fall short of what God wants from us and he jumped in and said then you try harder that is one solution people look for. The solution in Christianity is not that you try harder. It's in Romans chapter 3, which I have a, a verse for you. Can you go to this? Hmm. We'll go back to that other one. Right? If everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in His grace freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. This is the solution, God's grace. God coming through Jesus to make us right in His sight. This is good news. There is a God, and God is gracious and willing to forgive. You might be wondering why we, um, you quickly saw a picture of the movie Avatar. So let's go back there. Right? And maybe we'll end here. How many of you saw this movie? Ah, uh, see, most of you, right? So some guy imagined a world where people are blue, and there are floating islands in the sky, and there's all these weird flying creatures, right? What would you say about a guy who can imagine all this and make it into a movie? He's creative, right? To imagine that kind of world. But does that world exist in reality, or only does, it, does it only exist in the movies? Uh, he's a little limited. He could make it into a movie. He's got some skill, he's got some abilities, right? God imagined a world where there are human beings, there are paramecium, leopard seals, Trees, stars, all these things God imagined, but it didn't just remain an, an idea. It exists in reality. And when we recognize this, that we live in a world that is a gift from God to us, and our life is a gift from God to us, then we would say, isn't God worthy of our worship? Isn't God worthy of our thanks? Isn't God worthy of our love? Isn't God worthy of our life? And He has come to us through Jesus so that we can come to Him. Let's pray together. Father, I am well aware that my words are not sufficient to point people to the reality of who You are. And that my words are not sufficient to prove that you exist. But there is a knowledge of you that is evident through the world you have created. Sometimes we ignore that knowledge, suppress it or hide it, because it would be inconvenient to say yes to Jesus. But today, Lord, I ask you help us to be honest. 
and to acknowledge these complex things in our heart that we sometimes want to hold on to our own will, our own way, our own pride, our ego. Help us now to put those things aside and say, yes, Jesus, forgive my sins, make me new. And I do pray, Lord, that you use your word and use this sermon to move people towards you because you are good and your desire is for people to know your goodness and to know your love. I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.